You might already know that some frequencies in a mix can mask other frequencies. In a moment, I'll show you some audio examples of masking and some techniques for fixing masking in a mix. I'll also introduce you to an intelligent EQ plugin called Gulfas that operates on some very interesting psychoacoustic principles, allowing us to solve problems that were previously impossible to solve with traditional EQ plugins. Up until November 30th, you can get Gulfas for 40% off by using the link below. Thanks to Sound Theory for sponsoring this video. Let's start with a simple audio example of masking that I found in a video by Professor Dr. Bernhard Saber. This isn't a real-world example, but it's really helpful as a starting point. We'll hear some narrow band noise centered at 1.2 kHz. Then we'll hear a series of tones that incrementally increase in frequency. The first few tones will be audible as they're below the frequency range of the noise. But then, as the frequency of the tone increases, it will disappear within the noise. Finally, we'll be able to hear the tones as they come out the other side of that frequency range. This gives us some helpful insight into the behavior of masking. Insight number one is that frequencies will mostly mask similar frequencies. That's one reason why a kick drum and bass line may fight each other when they occupy the same frequency range. But this demonstration also shows us that sound in a particular frequency range can mask frequencies just above and below that range. When you look at the masking behavior of a pure tone on a graph, you'll see that sounds tend to more effectively mask higher frequencies compared to lower frequencies, especially as you increase the level of the masking sound. This is called the upward spread of masking. And if you stack up a series of tones across the frequency spectrum, the frequencies between those tones will be masked as a result of this upward spread. This is a common issue in mixing because our music is made up of several instruments, each containing several frequencies. So the sheer complexity of all of that energy at all of those different frequencies makes it hard to carve out enough space for listeners to hear the most important elements of our music. Think of your music like a group of people setting up for a group photo. Each individual person may look great on their own, but in order to create a great overall photo, the photographer needs to organize the people so that no one in the back rows is obstructed by someone sitting in the front row. This is similar to a mix in that we need to organize or balance all of the components of the mix so as to not obstruct any other components. I want to be clear, masking doesn't only exist between different instruments. Frequency imbalances and acoustic resonances on a single track can have masking effects on the other frequencies within that same track, making the music more difficult for our brains to process, which usually makes for a less enjoyable listening experience. Many masking problems can be solved with simple EQ boosts or cuts. For example, we know that frequencies may mask each other if they occupy the same range. So if a kick drum and bass are masking each other, we might choose to carve out some space in the bass track to make room for the kick to shine through. We also know that masking tends to spread upward. So while we may be able to boost the higher frequencies in a dull sounding acoustic guitar, we could perhaps get similar results by cutting the lower frequencies to reduce their masking effect on the higher frequencies.
However, traditional EQs only get you so far due to a couple of limitations. In our kick drum and bass example, we were able to cut the fundamental frequency of the kick drum out of the bass track to free up space in the spectrum. And that was relatively simple because the kick drum resonates at the same fundamental frequency every time. But what if the bass is masking the guitar? We could dial in an EQ on the guitar track to cut the fundamental frequency of the bass, but in the next bar of the song, the fundamental frequency of the bass could change. With a traditional parametric EQ, we could add another cut at that frequency, and then another cut at the next frequency, and so on, or we could use one wider EQ cut, but pretty soon we're going to destroy our guitar sound. This is one big advantage of a plugin like Gulfus. It's an EQ that dynamically alters its frequency response more than 300 times per second, so it can adaptively select which frequencies to control, even when those frequencies are always changing. Gulfus is not intended to replace the mixing process. We should still use the corrective EQ and dynamics processing that we would have always used, but then we can let Gulfus sort out the more complex problems as a finishing touch. The tame control in Gulfus reduces the frequencies that are masking other elements, while the recover control boosts frequencies that are being masked. Listen to the power of using corrective EQ and Gulfus on this rhythm section. In addition to having a static frequency parameter, traditional EQs also have a static gain parameter. That means that if we cut 8 kHz from the vocal to address harsh sibilance that may be masking other elements of the mix, the EQ will cut 8 kHz out of the entire vocal, not just the sections where the harsh sibilance becomes a problem. She sells seashells down by the seashore. She sells seashells down by the seashore. This is where we might use automation to duck those harsh sections, but that would duck all frequencies in the vocal, not just the harsh frequencies specifically. Instead, we might choose to use a deesser, which is like a compressor triggered by a specific frequency range or frequency. However, sibilance comes in many forms, from sh to s to t, -t and everywhere in between, meaning we may need to use several deessers or a wider, more aggressive deesser to address the varying quality of sibilance throughout the entire performance. And because the deesser operates by compressing the signal, it may result in audible harmonic distortion. She sells seashells down by the seashore. She sells seashells down by the seashore. Alternatively, we might reach for a dynamic EQ plugin where we can set multiple EQ filters that will only attenuate the signal when energy in that range surpasses a defined threshold. In this case, the EQ would only be active when sibilance becomes too prominent. But again, this would be restricted to a set of fixed frequency ranges defined by the mixing engineer. She sells seashells down by the seashore. She sells seashells down by the seashore. Using a tool like Gulfus addresses all of these issues. We can set the frequency range parameter in Gulfus to the sibilance range, and Gulfus will intelligently boost or cut as necessary according to its computational model of the way humans perceive sound. She sells seashells down by the seashore. She sells seashells down by the seashore. It's not a compressor. It doesn't enhance the harmonic character of the signal. It's just an EQ where the frequency response changes more than 300 times per second, only cutting or boosting problematic frequencies once they become a problem. And that brings me to my next point. In addition to the limitations we've already discussed, traditional EQs, deessers, dynamic EQs, and multiband compressors are not intelligent, which puts the burden of setting the parameters on us. The most incredible opportunity that comes with using cutting-edge plugins like Gulfos 
is that we can now address extremely complex problems in our audio that were previously impossible to fix. Ideally, your recordings will be super clean and free of any acoustic resonances or phase problems, but that isn't always the case. For many of us, that's almost never the case, right? Take, for example, this acoustic guitar recording that was made right here in my home studio. It sounds okay, but there are some issues in the mid-range that I just can't seem to fix with EQ. The messy, smearing quality that we hear in this guitar recording are a result of the phase interactions in the room, the sound of the instrument itself, and the microphone position. You could definitely address these problems before recording, but short of re-recording, what can be done? First of all, this is a polyphonic instrument, which means there are several areas throughout the frequency spectrum where masking could occur, and the target moves every time the chord changes. Plus, there are reflections in the room that result in phase interference and comb filtering. Addressing all of these problems with EQ is theoretically possible, but it would require a lot of automation and dozens of EQ bands. Let's see what Gulfus can do. You may notice that Gulfas automatically compensates so that the perceived loudness remains the same when bypassed or engaged, making A-B testing much easier with this plugin. You don't want to fool yourself into thinking something sounds better just because it sounds louder. It's important to understand that masking is a psychoacoustic phenomenon. In the first example, the tones were present the whole time, even though they seemed to disappear behind the noise. We didn't hear them through the noise because of the limitations of the human auditory system. And this is why Gulfus is so effective, because it utilizes a computational model of audio perception. These new plugins that have come out over the last few years are starting to get a little crazy. Let me know in the comments what you think. Go check it out for yourself with the free trial link below. And if you like it, now is the time to buy because the 40% off offer ends November 30th. Also, watch the video that's on your screen now to learn a simple trick that you can use to instantly improve your listening skills, and therefore instantly improve your mixes. I'll see you there.